Okay, or my path to PhD here at James Cook University, Australia. So, let's see. yes. So currently, I am a second year PhD student at James Cook University. I'm on the parents campus, and here we study. I am a member of the Lucas Lab, and our area of study is immunoparasitology. And immunoparasitology is, it investigates the impact of parasites and the host drip immune response. So the area that we focus on is the study of parasitic helminth secretomes. And this is to be used in the application of for um, diagnostics or immunotherapeutics. But my project specifically in the lab focuses around hookworm extracellular vesicles, which, and the impact that these vesicles have on host immune system during host parasite interaction. And I'll talk to you a bit more about that later. So my path to PhD started in 2016 when I transferred to Smith College as an Ada Comstock scholar. And my journey began in the lab as a junior of, as in my, during my junior year in the lab of Dr. Stephen Williams. And this is because I had an interest in public health and neglected tropical diseases. And neglected tropical diseases are mainly um, in tropical areas and mostly affect impoverished communities disproportionately affecting women and children. And they are called neglected because though these diseases can be treated to eradication, they still um, have high persistence among um, these poor communi um, communities. So in my junior year, I began a project in the development of a diagnostic assay for um, Manzanella persons which is a filarial nematode. And this project started in my junior year and culminated into a master's thesis. And on my slide, what, you, what I'm, you're seeing, can you see my pointer? Can everybody see my pointer here? No? No, I can't see your pointer. How about now? Yeah. No? Yeah. Okay. So what on my on my slide here is the vector that trans that transmits the filarial nematode, which is shown um, up in the top right hand corner of my slide. This is the filarial nematode, um, mentanella persistens, and mentanella persistens is predominantly found in sub-Saharan. Africa, where it causes um, that it is it causes uh, diagnostic complications because it is so closely related to um, Wuchereria bancrofti that is the agent for lymphatic filariasis. So it was key for us to develop a new molecular diagnostic assay for the for the detection of mancinella person. Then we did this using human blood because as you can see at the time of my project and still somewhat now, who recommends microscopy as the gold standard for the detection and differentiation of these two nematodes. And it's, kind, it's very challenging to do that. And this master's thesis project was supervised by Dr. Laurie Saunders and, and Dr. Niels Pelote in the Williams lab, as I um, previously um, stated. But I was able to complete my master's thesis in August 6, 2021. I had to do this online because of COVID. So luckily I had started this program during my junior year and was able to get most of my lab work Done, but I was able to do the analytics and um, the write-up of my thesis uh, 
um, away here in Australia that I come to before the lockdown had begun. So while in while when I completed towards the ending of my undergrad um, thesis, I said towards the end of my master's thesis, excuse me, um, I said, okay, I would like to pursue a PhD. And the reason that I wanted to pursue a PhD was I wanted to, I was interested and wanted to learn more about home in biology. And I wanted to learn about um, drug development. But I had to take some key considerations um, before deciding to start my journey. So one was the time and effort and resources that it would require me to build the knowledge and skills necessary to um, complete my PhD after doing my master's. So why did I, how did I choose this program? So some of them, the factors were time, cost, and my, the um, area of study that I was interested in. So in the PhD, um, the average time to complete your PhD in the US, the average time to complete your PhD is normally four to seven years. And in, 2000, in 2020, during COVID, um, a lot of PhD students took six to 12 years to complete their programs, while the average time to complete your PhD in Australia takes 3.5 to four years. And I also, so that's a big time difference in choosing in between the US and choosing to study here in Australia. And also I thought about the opportunity cost of while I'm completing my PhD, I wouldn't be able to work. So, you know, that's like income that I'm not getting at the time. And I also wanted a program that would capture my interest of continuing what I started at Smith College, working with neglected tropical diseases. And so, you know, when the, the joy of learning is like great, but when you're a first generation student and um, I'm an Ada Comstock scholar, so I'm a student of non-traditional age. It's that 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 is the reason why time and costs was so important for me. So, but the main deciding factor of why I chose to come to James Cook University was that I re I when I searched who was doing cutting edge research and had a robust program in um, doing drug development using Hellman products, that Dr. Alex Lucas's lab was the lab that I found. Um, that was the only lab that I found um, that was um, doing cutting edge research and um, was able to capture my interest for the what for the specific niche interest that I had. And so and so in the uh, in the lab or is research fo is focused around creating vaccines and diagnostics and other um, potential therapeutics towards the treatment of um, IBD and diabetes or and wound healing. Although my specific research topic that I'm about to talk to you about, um, this potential um, novel drug that I'm interested in developing is around the treatment of IBD. So in the lab of Dr. Alex Lucas, my project is looking at hookworm and their extracellular vesicle microRNAs that target mammalian 
host genes that are involved in gut inflammation. And what this means that I am looking at the microRNAs that are in the, the vesicles of hookworms that are might be able to interact to downregulate gut inflammation in IBD. So you might be wondering, what are extracellular vesicles? Well, extracell extracellular vesicles are lipid-bound sacs that are manufactured within the cell and is secreted into the extracellular space for cell-to-cell -cell communication. And these um, vesicles, they are not able to, they're not self-replicating. So they have to be produced within the cell and they function to transport protein and nucleic acids, such as micro microRNAs, which I am interested in. And EVs are secreted by all cells, by the cells of all eukaryotes, which means that they are also secreted created by um, blood feeding gastrointestinal nematodes such as hookworms. And what I'm showing you here is the hookworm life cycle. And the thing that is important is that um, in our, sorry, in our lab, we, before I talk to you about what's important in our lab, we are interested in the hookworm species um, which is A. silanicum, which is a zoonotic species and can be transmitted. If this species infects both human and dogs and um, is frequently transmitted from dogs to humans. And what we're also interested in the species, um, Nicator americanus, and this hookworm species predominantly affects, um, it affects only humans, its main species is human. So what I, this is the hookworm life cycle and what is important here is that, that the, the life cycle starts when like an infected person comes into contact with uh, the larvae that is in the soil and they, the, these larvae are able to penetrate skin and eventually the hookworms end up in the small intestine of the, their human host where they're able to um, latch on, feed, but they secrete a milieu of products that helps them to remain in their host for a long time. And they do this by suppressing the immune system. Sorry. And in this mil in the in the milieu of products that the hookworms are able to secrete, there are soluble proteins and small molecules, but there are also extracellular vesicles. And what we think that these products could be very useful um, in regulating inflammation because especially for a person who is um, has a who is suffering from irritable bowel disorder, they usually have a type 1 inflammatory response, which is governed by TH, T helper cell 17 and T helper cells one, and it causes a lot of information. And we know that hookworm and their product, hookworm and their products are able to drive a T helper type two response. And this T helper type two response is able to modulate um, the change the immune system um, to bring down inflammation and make um, the inflammatory process in, in, in more um, normalized and not like what is seen so, so in an unhealthy person. So the TH2 response looks more of a, like that you would see in a healthy, uh, in the gut of a healthy individual. 
So, so um, hookworms are like um, the cells of all other, um, all eukaryotic cells, but in hookworms also, what I want to show you here is that their cells are able to make three types of extracellular vesicles. And these are exosomes, which can range from 30 nanometers to 150 nanometers, microvesicles um, that are ranging from 200 nanometers to one micrometer, and apoptic bodies, um, which range from one micrometer to five micrometers. But I am interested in exosomes because um, exosomes are the and are the extracellular vesicles or EVs that contain and transport microRNAs, which is what I am interested in. And within the cell, these extracellular vesicles, all extracellular vesicles, they are sorted and um, re sorted and re and sent out by the cell through the endo, sorry, through the, the endocy endocytic recycling pathway. And so after these vesicles are sorted and sent out by the cell through the endocytic recycling pathway, they, the cells are able to send out these vesicles which can be taken up by um, the a, a recipient cell. And so par in the par host parasite interaction, to put that into context, the cells of parasites can, can send out these vesicles, which are able to be picked up by the recipient host cells. And these um, vesicles can be picked up in three different ways. They can be picked up um, by pinocytosis or phagocytosis. They can be picked up through receptor-mediated endocytosis, or they can be endocytosed by host cells. And so the microRNAs within these exosomes, they are able to, when picked up, the microRNAs from these parasite um, vesicles, when they are picked up by the host cells, they are able to enter the host cells and perhaps we think bind to messenger RNAs. And by binding to the messenger RNAs, so they can be they can be bound imperfectly, where they stop, they're 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 able to inhibit the translation of these messenger RNAs um, in the host or they can bind perfectly where the messenger, the messenger RNA gets degraded. And so we think because of this action that microRNAs are very useful as gene silencing tools, um, especially in disease where, diseases where messenger RNAs can be overly expressed to cause a disease phenotype. And we, uh, we know that these parasitic microRNAs can go undergo horizontal transfer to host cells, and that makes them a very potential um, novel treatment for IBD therapy. And because of this, um, I've, I, my hypothesis for my project in the Lucas lab is that microRNAs found inside hookworm EVs specifically target inflammation-related host genes and suppress their, in, their inflammation. And <laughs> these are my five aims that I'll share with you quickly and allow um, Dr. Risher to present um, his. <laughs> um, but um, my first aim will be to isolate the, 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 the EVs from the hookworms and to do a phenotype and characterization of them. And then my second aim will be to identify the main target cells for uptake in using organoid systems, um, which are uh, cystic organoids are um, 
systems that are made of cell that are used to replicate the lumen of the gastrointestinal tract. And um, my third aim will be to identify the main cell types that are targeted by the perm EVs in vivo and to uh, assess their impact on gene expression. And to, to my fourth aim after that will be to confirm target binding sites and the impact of the the microRNAs present in the hookworm EVs, what are their impact on the host translation, the translation of the messenger RNAs, and also to assess the efficacy of the microRNAs within the hookworm EVs in a mouse colitis model, and to look at different routes that I am able to deliver these EVs to mice that are suffering from colitis. And now I'll hand over to Dr. Fisher to present. Let's just stop sharing. Is Thank that you okay? so much. That's perfect. Thank you. Um, all right, Dr. Ruscher um, obtained a German diploma, which is approximately an MS um, Master's in Science, yeah, from the University of Cologne and the German Aerospace Center in Germany, and a PhD in 2014 in the field of immunology from the University of Queensland Translational Research Institute in Australia. He then joined um, Professor Kristen Hockwitz's group at the University of Minnesota as a postdoctoral fellow and then returned to Australia in 2018, where he currently holds a senior research fellowship position at James Cook University's Australian Institute of Tropical Health and Medicine. Um, and I'll let you jump into discussing your research rather than me just reading a little blurb. Is that good? <laughs> thanks, Jess, and thanks for having me today. Um, I can see that this is being recorded, so do feel free to distribute it later among students. Um, Great, from thank you. Um, I'm just going to share my screen here before I get started. All right, so hopefully you can see my PowerPoint slide here. Just need to go into presentation mode. Yeah, there we go. All right, yeah, so um, as, uh, um, just to introduce, so my, my name is Roland. Um, I'm a senior research fellow at the um, James Cook University, specifically the um, Australian Institute of Tropical Health and Medicine. So senior research fellow, I don't think that exists um, in the United States, but over there it would be something between an assistant professor and an associate professor. And um, I'm not a parasitologist. Um, I'm a basic immunologist. Um, and I'm most interested in gut immunology, so I'm going to focus on that. And this is going to be a fairly um, less less detailed talk compared to Tamara's. Um, so Tamara has already introduced um, the, the greater group of Professor Alex Lucas, who is interested in Helminth, and um, Tamara's PhD is somewhere along these lines here. And I uh, used to be a postdoc, a senior postdoc in Alex's group. But I am now also um, sort of budding off a little bit and become more independent and am establishing my own research group. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. So just just a little bit of more background about myself. So you can hear from my accent that I'm not Australian. I'm, I'm half German, um, so I would have more of a German accent. <laughs> but I did my PhD in uh, Australia at the University of Queensland on um, autoimmunity and a specific immune cell subset called regu regulatory T cells in the gut. And after I received my PhD, um, I did a postdoc for a number of years at the Univers University of Minnesota up in the north. Um, nice, beautiful summers, I have to say, but also very brutal cold winters, but I did enjoy my time over there. So <laughs> I worked there mostly on intestinal intraepithelial lymphocytes, which I'm going to introduce a little more in a minute. Um, after my postdoc has finished in the USA, I returned to Australia, um, to the um, tropical parts of Australia, and started working in Alex Lucas's group. And um, initially, I was mostly involved with um, a spin-off company that Alex has developed, Perigen Bio, which uh, was mostly focusing on co-evolution in spider therapeutics for inflammatory bowel disease. So Tamara just talked a little bit about that. And uh, just, just as a little bit of a side shoot here, um, what, what that involved, and we, we then published on a number of proteins that are being secreted by parasites, uh, specific, specifically by these hookworms. And we then developed a pipeline to screen these um, proteins. Um, so we, we generated recombinant versions, tested them in mouse models of inflammatory bowel disease, 
Uh, then also did some um, human studies where we uh, isolated um, immune cells from, from the gut of, of human volunteers and tested the um, proteins in those as well. And um, basically after screening through um, roughly 100 proteins, we came up with six to eight proteins that actually had quite potent anti-inflammatory properties. And all of this is published in uh, PNAS um, it last, last year. So I'm, I'm going to have a slide where all my publications, the relevant publications will be shown as well. So um, you can look up those for a bit more detail. Well, and since um, I'm now starting to establish my own program, which has to do with mucosal and specifically gut T cell biology, I have received a government grant from, from Australia to do this kind of work. And that's what I'm going to talk about more today. So this is where I am right now, uh, Tamara as well. So we are at the Australian Institute of Tropical Health and Medicine or AITHM at the James Cook University. Um, we have multiple buildings. And this is one of the main buildings uh, where Tamara and I are working. Um, and Cairns has very beautiful beaches and it's, 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 a nice, it's a nice lifestyle. So I just wanted to show this here as well <laughs> as a bit of a teaser. Um, and we have quite a lot of state-of-the-art facilities. So it's, it's a bit of a remote area. It's up in the tropics, but um, we still have quite a lot of good facilities that we can use here, such as we just got a new confocal microscope. And whatever is highlighted in red is what I, is what, what I am working with mostly. So we have a new confocal microscope. We have a um, tra transmission electron microscope. I normally work mostly with flow cytometry or facts. We can also sort and isolate cells. We have proteomics going on here. We just started doing some single cell RNA sequencing. And we have multiple labs, um, PC2 and PC3. I think they're called something else in the United States, but it basically means that we can do infection studies uh, that are high security labs. And um, I am using these for establishing so-called dirty mice, uh, which I'm going to introduce as well. So my uh, grant is for a total of five years. So I still have um, nearly four years left on this one. And there are two PhD projects. One is ongoing and one is starting soon. And I might be able to carve out one additional project um, so that if, if anybody is interested in that, um, I would encourage you to get in touch with me and we could discuss details. Um, so my program is gut because of T-cell immunology. Uh, more specifically, I'm interested in developmental aspects as well as functional aspects. So on the developmental side of things, I'm looking at selection and maturation of these gut T-cells, their ontogeny and maintenance, as well as their lifespan and replenishment. So what was the turnover rate in the gut? On the functional side of things, I'm looking at responses to the microbiota, so um, bacteria of the gut, as well as parasites. I'm looking at age-related effects and um, mostly with a focus on intestinal diseases such as inflammatory bowel disease and colorectal cancer. So just to, to um, show the um, health relevance here. Um, so if you're looking at inflammatory bowel diseases and the two main types would be Crohn's disease um, as well as um, colitis in, in humans. And on the right side here, we're looking at colorectal cancer. And what's shown here are the incidence rates um, across a lifetime. So you can see that inflammatory bowel diseases um, more commonly have their onset in earlier life, around 15 to 25 years of age, whereas um, colorectal cancer um, has, has their onset mostly in, in slightly later life. So um, mostly people over 50 would be affected by colorectal cancer. Um, that just... Um, depicted here on, on the right side. And one of the immune cells that are implicated in both inflammatory bowel disease as well as colorectal cancer would be um, in intestinal intraepithelial lymphocytes or IELs. And these are mostly T cells which are embedded in the intestinal epithelium. We can see that there are multiple subsets um, and I don't need to go into details because that's um, uh, probably a little bit too much for now, but these um, IELs are also involved in both inflammatory bowel disease as well as colorectal cancer. And um, up until now, I have mostly focused on one of these subsets, they're called CD alpha alpha IELs. And I just wanted to um, show these three publications. If, if anybody's interested in, in more detail um, of, of the actual immunology behind this, uh, they can look up these papers. So I have published on um, 
uh, so we, we discovered a novel um, precursor subset to these um, immune cells. Uh, this was in 2017. Uh, this one here is a review article, which basically just um, summarizes the work that I had done previously, as well as the work of other people. And then in 2020, I published another paper where we had a look at how these cells actually develop in early life and over a lifetime. Um, just because I mentioned flow cytometry, so I just wanted, and this is one of the very few data slides that I have here. <laughs> so I just wanted to show you that you can distinguish these different IEL subsets by flow cytometry. Um, and I don't know how, how much um, students there know about this, but you can basically label for specific markers with um, fluorochrome labeled antibodies. And you can then distinguish them after you have analyzed them by, by um, or have run those cells through your flow cytometry effects. Um, and you can basically distinguish multiple subsets, and that's all I just wanted to show you quickly. Um, some of the main research questions that I'm interested in right now would be um, the genetic and functional differences between these IELs or other mucosal T cells as well that are developing in early versus later life. So just remember, um, inflammatory bowel disease um, occurs in earlier life, whereas colorectal cancer um, occurs mostly in later life, but these IELs are involved in both. So I'm trying to understand why that is, and we are asking these fundamental questions to get an angle on that. And what is the actual lifespan of these IEL subsets, as well as other T cells in the gut? And I'm also interested in a few other tissues and their ontogeny and thymic development. Um, so the thymus is an organ that is basically just placed above your heart. And that's where most, if not all T cells are maturing before they go into the rest of the body. And these IELs, since they're T cells, they're also developing in the thymus. Um, so I'm trying to understand how they actually develop in the thymus and how they then get into the gut. Um, as I mentioned, I'm not going to show too much data, but I wanted to introduce two what I think um, are quite fun mouse models. I'm working mostly with mouse models, but also um, with some human tissue. So we're trying to translate whatever we find in a mouse to a human setting as well. So if this is a mouse across its uh, lifespan, and if you're interested in a certain immune cell subsets um, ac across their lifespan, you can um, you can isolate T cells or other immune cells at any kind of age that you're interested in. And that is a good approach, but it only gives us a snapshot. So it doesn't allow us to actually um, track immune cells that develop at a specific age into later life, because you can only at any time take out the whole immune cell pool. And that's what you can analyze. But uh, we have a mouse model, which we call the um, timestamp fate mapping mouse model. Um, and this allows us to inject um, tamoxifen in, into the mice. And what tamoxifen does is it um, enables, um, well, we call it a genetic switch, so, so to speak. So it turns on a reporter protein, which is fluorescent. So what this basically does is it labels all those T cells that are developing at the time where you inject your tamoxifen. Tamoxifen is only in the mouse for two or three days. It has a fairly short half-life. What this then means is that you can track these cells over a lifetime. So and at any kind of age that you're interested in, you can take out the immune cells. And because those that you have labeled um, at, at any given age that you're interested in, because they are fluorescent, you can actually discriminate them from all other T cells that develop at any other stage in life and then do specific analysis. So you can ask questions around how long do they actually um, um, live um, in the gut and um, would they be functionally different? Do they change their functions over a lifetime, et cetera? And you can, of course, um, place your timestamp at any other age that you're interested in and um, ask similar questions. So this is a mouse model that I'm, I'm currently using quite heavily to um, try and answer some of these questions, um, but it would also be uh, quite helpful in looking at things like vaccination strategies, fate decisions that um, T cells uh, might take, etc. All right, and then um, I just wanted to show you another second mouse model. Um, and before I do that, I just want to make the point that it is actually important to use mouse models in immunology research. It's one of the main tools that we have because it is difficult to 
obviously for obvious reasons, um, difficult to um, get a lot of research done with humans, even though the field is moving more towards humans. But uh, mice are still very important. Um, and I'm not going to explain all of this in detail, but there are multiple disease models um, in, with, with mice. Um, you can look at treatment strategies, medications, vaccines. Um, a lot of important immune cells have been discovered in mice and then later in uh, humans as well. So, <coughs> excuse me. Overall, <coughs> mouse models allow us a better understanding of the immune system and diseases and development of treatments and vaccines for humans. However, um, and I'm just um, I'm quoting two different sources here. So this is from uh, Science 2016, where they say, when it comes to animal models of the immune system, laboratory mice are like the clean version of a profane song. They are still pretty good, but they may not capture the grid of real life. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, my former colleague, David Maskell, at the University of Minnesota, um, he said that lab mice have had a very privileged existence, but we humans, we simply don't live like that. So what can we do differently? Um, and this is what, what I call a problem. It's not really a problem, but I just wanted to highlight a few points here um, that, that uh, could be problematic with these clean laboratory mice that we are using these days. So they are housed in so-called specific pathogen-free conditions. So that just means that they are housed in quite very clean environments and a lot of pathogens, mouse specific uh, pathogens have been excluded. And we have held them in such conditions for roughly 60 years now. Um, this means that there's nearly no pathogen exposure or infections. They have a fairly limited microbiota. So over these 60 years and multiple generations, they have lost their the, um, diversity of the um, microbiota to some extent. And their immune profile resembles that of a newborn human baby. Many vaccines and drugs that work in mouse models fail to do so in subsequent human studies. And there's therefore a low overall translatability and therefore high chance of eventually failing studies, high cost for poor results. So um, more and more research groups around the world are now asking the question, could so-called dirty mice be a tool for added relevance? So I'm, I'm just going to uh, look at uh, one or two points here. Um, the immune profile. Um, so there's, there's a, a model that they use at the University of Minnesota, um, where I did my, my um, poster. And they use just standard laboratory mice. And then they go to pet shop and buy um, mice from the pet shop and place these um, pet shop mice into the same cage as the um, laboratory mouse. So now the laboratory mouse is taking over all these uh, mouse specific pathogens and the um, um, more natural microbiota from the pet shop mice. But the laboratory mouse itself is still genetically very similar to other laboratory mice. So you don't get convolution on, on a genetic level but you do get a more naturalized uh, microbiota as well as um, pathogen exposure. And um, this, this paper here from the University of Minnesota back then uh, could show that um, this means that the phenotype of immune cells of these so-called dirty mice are a lot more similar to the phenotype of immune cells of adult humans, which each one of us has been exposed to a number of um, infections uh, throughout our lives to a variety of infections. And we also have um, a fairly diversified microbiota. And they could show on a genetic level as well. Again, I'm not gonna go into details here because we don't have time for that. But um, so by phenotype as well as at a genetic level, they could show that these pet store co-host dirty mice um, were quite a lot more similar to um, adult humans compared to standard clean laboratory mice. Um, many vaccines and drugs that work in mouse models failed to do some subsequent human studies. And um, at the National Institutes of Health in the United States, there was another group looking at dirty mice in a, a slightly different context. Um, you, can, you can look at a, that paper. There will be a, a link to it um, in a second here. This is this paper here. So again, I'm not going to go through all this in detail, but basically what they did in this paper using another model of dirty mice. Um, so they, they showed that in two preclinical pre experiments where lab mice had previously failed to predict the human response to drug treatments, wildlings, which is their name, their, their model of um, dirty mice, 
accurately phenocopied patient outcomes. So the translatability um, of studies in these dirty mice is better than the translatability of studies in clean laboratory mice. Um, and just very quickly, so again, at the University of Minnesota, they, as now we're going back to our pet shop, co-housing dirty mouse model, they showed that um, vaccine responses of the immune system in dirty mice were a lot more similar to humans compared to vaccine responses in clean mice. So there's more and more papers coming out in um, high impact factor journals um, about um, various models of um, dirty mice. And so we decided to make a model here as well. And I, I wanted to generate a model where I get increased microbiota, so microbiota diversification, but don't get too much of uh, the added pathogens. Um, and the way I do this, uh, we, we have a separate building that is called Bush House, and I call these uh, mice the Australia source intestinally enriched or Aussie mice. <laughs> And, and I, I start with clean laboratory mice, put them into a cage, and then add natural materials such as soil, twigs, leaves into the cage uh, in order to make them dirty. So this is what that looks like. So the cage now has a lot of grass and uh, soil and natural materials. Let's see if this video works here. Yeah, so you can see how these mice, uh, once they're placed into the cage, start digging around and exploring the area. And I would have thought that some of these mice uh, would die because their um, immune system is actually not used to, to um, these bacteria, but actually all of them look very healthy and um, yeah, just had a very happy life. But, no, no, it's not that. Right. And um, then we did something called shotgun sequencing. So we wanted to have a look at what is actually happening with the bacteria in the gut. So these three mice are um, clean laboratory mice, and these three mice are um, these dirtier mice. So here we're looking at the overall abundance of bacteria in the gut. You can see that the um, dirty mice have a lot more bacteria compared to the clean mice. And down here, we are looking at the um, well, not the abundance, but we're looking at uh, the different um, types of bacteria. You can see that there is a diversification um, in these dirty mice as well compared to the clean mice. And we also screen for various pathogens that we don't want to have in the lab. Um, and um, these mice came back with negative results for all of these pathogens. There was a little bit of histology in, in the stomach. And um, that is something I still need to look into, but overall, they didn't seem to take up any kind of nasty bugs um, from um, being exposed to that. So basically, I'm, I'm also almost at the end here. Um, so the Aussie mice, uh, where we just put soil, et cetera, into the cages is one of the models that we are developing at the moment. But I also want to use the pet shop co-housing model that um, the people in Minnesota have developed. And, and that's going to be a second model that we can use here to answer certain questions um, of gut immunology and how the microbiota actually um, acts on the gut immune system. This is not me. This is one of my colleagues here with his students. And uh, so they are using these so-called PC3 facilities. Um, he is working on tuberculosis um, infections, and therefore he needs to do the studies in this lab. But this is also where um, the dirty mice are um, being housed um, moving forward. Uh, this is just my, my acknowledgments quickly. So um, a number of people at the University of Minnesota um, who have taught me a lot and also a few students um, that I have supervised over there. Uh, a number of people here at the James Cook University. I do have collaborators um, in Australia, further down in the south in Melbourne as well, and uh, some of the um, funding past and present. Um, and just very quickly, so this is the um, slide that might be interesting to some people who want to know about more detail, in, in more detail about what I'm actually doing. So these are, this is a paper about the um, hookworm derived proteins and the um, pipeline that I had shown very early on. And these three are the, the papers that um, I have produced during my time in the United States. Um, so you can look these up if you want to. Um, this is my email address and my portfolio website. And as a last slide, um, so we have a lot of, we have many other research groups as well, but I just want to focus on another two because they are mostly focusing on the medical um, research aspect here. One is Andrea Scutz, who is a guy um, that we just saw in the photo in the Indian PC3 lab. And he is um, mostly looking into the immuno immunology and, uh, of, and vaccine development for tuberculosis. And this is a link to his portfolio. 
and Indian Greater Alex Lucas Lab. Um, we are looking at development of vaccines and anti-inflammatory therapeutics from the hookworm cyclotron. So that's um, Alex Lucas as well as um, Paul Jackman, and their research portfolio links are shown here. And I'm pretty sure that's my last slide. Yes, it is. So thanks, thanks for your attention. Thank you so much. Um, we have a couple minutes for questions. Um, I'm happy to jump in with one to get us started. Um, and I guess both Tamara and Roland, you talked about how you've done research like across countries, across continents. And I'm curious if um, both or either of you are willing to talk a little bit about like what you've noticed about the way that research um, both overlaps and maybe differs based on where you're doing it. Um, should I get started, Tamara? Yeah. Right, sorry, just making sure that I look into the camera here. <laughs> um, so the question is how how research has overlapped across various countries, um, if I understood it right. Yeah. Um, so to, to me, it was more of a journey because I started as a student back in Germany and I was a biologist back then. Um, I had some um, exposure to just classic biology, um, but I then got interested in um, immunology. So immunology was one of the courses I took at the University of Cologne back in Germany. Um, and so after I moved from Germany to um, Australia to do my PhD, there was not too much of an overlap. Um, I mean, I could use some of the basics that I knew. So one of my courses in, in um, when studying biology was genetics and there were like certain molecular pathways. And one of those pathways was also what I then worked on uh, during my PhD in um, Australia. But I didn't know too much else about immunology. So a so lot of the things um, that I know now, actually I had to learn during my PhD um, at the University of Queensland. And then moving from Australia to um, to the USA for my for my postdoc, everything became a lot more detailed and in depth, and it was a, a great environment in the United States as well, just to to learn more about um, immunology. So it was I really appreciate that I actually had a chance to do that. Um, in terms of overlap, yes. Yeah, so I it, during my PhD, I started looking at gut immunology. I continued to do so. Um, doing my postdoc in the United States and uh, basically took that expertise with me back to Australia where I can now use it to um, look at these kind of research questions that I just introduced. And I'm just going to jump in and answer as well and say um, it was funny because I did this class with Professor White Ziegler at college and she gave us a she said okay um go out and find a project that you're interested in and come back and develop a therapeutic and for me it was the use of programs to treat asthma and so when I happened upon professor Alex Lucas I was super excited because of that initial you know um interaction that I that I had in and having to think about this critically while in the classroom at Smith College and so here I am and oh yeah it's time wow I can't believe it I'm actually getting to choose and interact with a project that's like so very similar you know I'm going to look at the gut it's not the the lung the airway but it's the concepts remain and so I'm, I was very grateful to have taken immunology, even though it was in my master's, I was very glad to have taken immunology with Professor White Ziegler because, and as Roland has pointed out, um, now I am having to like learn so much more about um, immunology as, because I only took like her basic classes and I wish I had taken more immunology as. So if there's anyone listening, don't like pass up that opportunity. Great. Um, thank, you. Yeah. thank you. And I had a question that just came in, which was how would you compare the academic and work culture um, and also living situation in the US versus Australia versus the other countries that you might have lived in? 
Tamara, do you want to? Okay, I, I might just uh, say a little bit about my experience. So, um, the work culture mostly was, I think that's what it was about. So, I found that in the United States, where I was at least, um, I, I was actually a little bit terrified to go to the US because it has a reputation of uh, having a very, very strict work culture. Um, and, but at the University of Minnesota, where I was at least, uh, it was actually, well, I don't know if relax is the right word, but it was not as strict as um, I had expected, but it was more, um, people were very interested in what they were doing. So it was actually quite, quite inspiring for me and um, very motivating. So even though I didn't have all that pressure that I thought I might have in the United States, I was working a lot and that's what helped me to um, get things done over there. Um, back here in Australia, I can only speak about um, Queensland because that's a state I've never been anywhere, I've been somewhere else, but I only worked in Queensland. Um, so here in Queensland, it's, it's more of a tropical or subtropical lifestyle. So it's probably a little bit more relaxed. Um, and, and I think there might be a little bit more of a work-life balance here from my experience compared to um, Minnesota. Not, not to say that uh, whatever was happening in Minnesota was bad because people were really, really interested in what they were doing. So I felt like back in Minnesota, people did what they did because they were super interested in it and it was a passion. Here, people are interested in it as well, but they see it a little bit more as a job and uh, also put a little more emphasis on their private life. That's that's my experience. Yeah, yeah there is a, a bigger um, influence on work-life balance here. Like, um, but I like, if, if you notice like the PhD time here is a lot shorter. So I really, even though I also try to maintain a work-life balance by maintaining my spiritual life, like, you know, going to church and doing fun activities, um, going to the beach with my friends and stuff like that. I also really like the, um, the, the work ethic that I developed at Smith because my advisor is uh, also like, Steve, he's very hands off. And so I've had that independence from Smith. So when I come here, I just know what I'm supposed to be doing, how I'm supposed to be managing my time, which is very important because I think, I don't think if I, I think, um, but I also get a lot of help because I don't just have a supervisor. I have a supervisor, I have two co-supervisors. So if I need help, I always have help. And then you have postdocs like Roland in the lab. If you run into trouble, you look over and you're like, ah, can you give me some advice on this? And he's always there and willing to help a lot with other postdocs. So you're in a very like nurturing environment, but just to have that independence and that um, intrinsic drive and to just have that inbuilt passion is very crucial, especially because you're operating on such a limited time. Great, thank you. Um, do you have time for one more quick question before we wrap up? Because I'm sensitive to the time. Great, so the last question I wanted to ask about was about the application timeline. Um, maybe tomorrow you could talk about that and or Roland um, in terms of applying for a potential position in your lab. Um, tomorrow, what you learned about the timeline versus in the US, right, where you apply like in the fall for the next year. Um, just a quick thing about that. So for the timeline for applications for international students, I feel like, um, okay, so there's a rolling timeline. You can always um, reach out to um, a postdoc or a, um, like, like Roland or like um, a PI like Alex or any of the group people because if they have scholarships and funding ready for you, it doesn't matter like when you, the, the, your concern there would be that your interest matches the interest of the lab. Um, but if you want to get the JCU scholarship, which is always good to have because um, it frees up more money from your postdoc for, I guess, um, the research that you're doing like buying the materials and other stuff like that. Um, it's good to have the JCU, if you want to get those research, those, I'm um, sorry, scholarships, the, the research scholarships, sometimes they ask you to have um, a, 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 a publication 
like have a have a have at least one publication to make you competitive with the other people who are coming in. And um, if you don't have that, still go ahead and apply. I didn't. My master's thesis publication wasn't out yet, and I it was in review, but I I could still get in. So I would tell people to still go ahead and apply. And um, that has specific um, time point. So for me, I I applied from the August period to because the cutoff date I think was in November. And I would say um, to come and to start in February. But there are other um, there are new there are different um, time periods when the scholarship that like that that where the scholarships are open. So I would also say to the students, um, just go on the James Cook University website and make sure like they're aware of those time points for the scholarships because they're what you get for your stipend. Even though you're the person that the researcher with whom you're interested to work, he might have also like a scholarship that's um, ready for a student. So reach out to people and look on the website too. Yeah, two things, sorry. Oh, that's great. Roland, anything you want to add? Yeah, not, not much to add. I mean, the time I was, was quite comprehensive there. So um, I, I'm going through the process right now with, with an applicant and um, she's, she's coming from Europe. Um, so international applicant is currently in the process of applying for a scholarship here, which is one of those that I um, am at liberty to give away, um, which is not, not the usual way to do it. Um, and that person um, is hopefully going to start here in roughly three to four months. So you might want to take into account visa application um, process and times, et cetera. Normally, um, the standard scholarships, I think the application deadline will be sometime in this, uh, sorry, in September every year, if I'm not mistaken. So that would give people um, some time to look into projects, but also early enough identify um, a, a potential PI um, and, and maybe discuss a project because for the application, you already need to submit an actual proposal, like a one or two page proposal and a few additional details. So it's good to already know what could potentially be done during a PhD and where the money's coming from, et cetera. So in terms of money, as I said, I have funding for at least another three and a half to almost four years. Um, and hopefully I will get additional grants um, along the way. So these kind of things need to be taken into account as well. Thanks. Great. And I have some very important information. So you, when you're writing this proposal, you're not expected to know everything. Like the PI will guide you in writing the proposal because you're a new student coming in and you, there's no way you can know everything about the project that you're about to work on. So like, don't be put off by this. And also, um, you don't have to write, there's not a lengthy application process. You don't have to write um, an essay. The, your recommenders go, go online and they, oh yeah, the letter of recommendation. You don't need an essay. And for the recommendation, your professors go online and they fill out um, a five minutes, five to 10 minutes um, assessment of whether or not they think you're ready to do a PhD. That's all it takes, that's all it takes. And then you just go in and you load up your resume and um, like, you know, your awards, your your passport for, for because you're gonna be an international student and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And I think the past, the, the if you apply for your student visa, you cannot come here before you get it. Don't come as a visitor because it will mess up your application. And the Australian immigration prioritizes students who are offshore. So because you're not on in Australia, you will get your visa before someone who is already here. This is all incredibly helpful. Thank you so much for joining us. I know that we ran a little bit over, um, but thank you for this really incredible presentation. Ellie, you wanna chime in with anything? 
Yeah, just a huge thank you for your time and all the information. And um, hopefully we'll send some students your way. <laughs> That's good. Thank thanks, you. thanks for your time as well. And thanks for making this happen. So we do really appreciate that too. Of course, thank you.